Jack Sakup, thanks for the invitation. Thanks uh, for putting together another great program. Appreciate everyone staying for the last session. So old school uh, was the uh, the assignment. Here are my disclosures, nothing relevant to, to my talk today. And one more disclosure, I borrowed a bunch of slides from uh, some of the OTA uh, archives of talks uh, for this. Um, and Dr. Alpine, of course. So old school was the assignment. So I started Googling old school and some all sorts of interesting things came out, van shoes, this movie. Any of you guys seen this movie? A couple of people? All right, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quiz you a little bit on a couple of things here. So when I think old school, everyone's old school is different. Who knows these two? Who knows the group on the left? Show of hands. Mostly gray haired people in the room. How about the, how about the three young ladies on the right? Not this one said not that young anymore. <laughs> definitely, definitely true. What's that? Yeah, Run DMC, Song Peppa. What about these guys? There was a Nirvana song playing in the OR the other day, and I asked one of the med students, "What is this?" And I told they didn't know, so I said, "I told them what it was." Oh, they said that's classic rock. Any takers on this? Do you guys know what this is? Hopefully. I still watch this show almost every single day, just so you know. This is what I do in the evening. I just turn this on. I go through my emails before I go to bed. It's like a warm blanket watching Seinfeld. What about this? So I often tell people that residency, surgical residency is essentially Jedi training. And every year, less and less kids have seen any of the Star Wars movies, which I think is absolutely amazing. So anyways, this was our assignment. This is what we're trying to do. So we're looking at disarray's X-fix or external fixation in general. And I was thinking about this today because there was a lot of presentations and I, has, I was given this assignment. There wasn't really, it was very few images of any external fixation on any of the slides, on any of the topics, which I thought was really interesting. So there has been a significant movement away from external fixation, but there is still a role and there's some value in it. And when I was training, we were still, you know, X-fixing disarrays fractures. It wasn't so crazy. It was unusual. Frankly, in the 90s, it was a mainstay of surgical management of disarrays fractures was external fixation. And my training was in the early 2000s and we were starting to move away from it, but still very much doing it. So let's talk a little bit about that, learn about some of the principles, some of the indications. Uh, well, then we'll talk uh, in X-fix, generally then specific to disarrays, indications and techniques for it. So in terms of what the principles of external fixation is, it's using external bars to manipulate bone with pins placed through limited incisions. So it really leverages a number of, of, of advantages, it limits uh, less soft tissue dissection, minimizing or avoiding deep hardware uh, and, and utilizing indirect bone reduction and joint manipulation. So some of the advantages of external fixation, it's quick application, it's minimally invasive, uh, can be both temporary or definitive. Uh, it can be useful in reconstructions such as malunions, nonunions, infection cases as well. Some of the disadvantages, uh, it can often be inadequate fixation and lend itself to malunions. It can sometimes over distract and lend itself to nonunions. Um, it can injure structures, especially nerves and tendons when they're being placed. Uh, they can be heavy for a patient to manage. They can fail uh, uh, while they're being used by patients. They can get infected. If there's too much tension, you can develop joint contraction. And this is probably not a complete list. I'm sure there's other disadvantages uh, of, dis of external fixation. Broadly, though, I think if you look at what the indications for X-fix are, there's several. And again, this is not an absolute list, and there's more that we can identify. But it's, it's, it's a role for definitive fracture care, such as perhaps in an open fracture situation where um, internal fixation is contraindicated. Uh, temporary fracture fixation is probably one of the most common things is still indicated for now, where you're temporizing a fracture, maybe a pelvic ring injury, maybe a plateau or a pylon uh, fracture. If you're dealing with an infection like osteo, where you can't really put internal fixation, you can, then, you can, you can cross it and then deformity correction as well. So let's Let's switch gears specifically to the distal radius. So can those same indications be applied to the distal radius and or are there different indications when it comes to the distal radius? I think that there are basically the same indications you can apply to the distal radius. You can use it for definitive fracture care. We use it less and less, but if there's a, if there's a reason where internal fixation is contraindicated, maybe a contaminated mood, wound, maybe a soft tissue bed that can't accommodate a plate, uh, maybe a gunshot wound or what have you, a blast injury, degloving injury, 
then external fixation could absolutely both temporize and definitively manage a fracture. Uh, similarly, temporary fixation, you can use it in the short term. Perhaps you're dealing with a vascular injury. You need to, the vascular injury is taking priority over the bony. Uh, a bony injury, you can, temp you can temporize the fracture and get, get immediate stability, uh, while uh, you can then proceed with the vascular work, which may be more time sensitive than the fracture work, so it can be done temporarily. Again, soft tissue injuries as well apply to that. Perhaps there's an infection case, again, where you're trying to manage an infection, but also um, a, a non-union or a deformity. Uh, you can then bridge the area where the infection is and not have any hardware in there. And again, deformity correction is always an option. Here's a lengthening uh, being done for a prior, uh, shortened deformity of the radius. So a lot of different ways you can utilize this. So indeed, there's still a lot of indications for it, uh, depending on the circumstance. So let's switch gears. What about the techniques for disarrays external fixation? Well, first of all, I think it's important to know the different types. And broadly, you can, character, you can categorize the techniques for disarrays fraction into a few. One's spanning, so joint spanning, so it spans the wrist joint itself. One's non-spanning or non-wrist joint spanning, so it doesn't cross the wrist joint. Uh, a hinged fixator, so you cross the joint, but you allow motion to occur at that joint, or some kind of hybrid construct um, as well. So I'm going to just focus on spanning um, uh, uh, of disarranged fractures. So I'm going to keep it real simple in terms of technique. Again, we're just trying to remind ourselves uh, and keep it relatively simple in terms of how to use this. And I bet in most hospitals, if you go through uh, the various shelves, you'll find a disarranged set somewhere hiding on the shelves. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's worthwhile to uh, identify where those are because you never know when you might need one of these. From a hardware perspective, again, there's different systems, different companies carry them. Um, they might use different terms like small, medium, large X fixes. Some companies have disarray specific X fixes. So again, it just depends. So this is a small disarray X fix system. What you need basically are pins, clamps, and rods in terms of what you need in order to establish a construct. A couple of things you need to know. So first of all, exposing. So a couple of tips. Um, you're gonna be placing uh, one or two pins in the uh, metacarpal, index metacarpal generally. Um, two is preferable, and then two in, in the radius proximally. Exposing down to bone is helpful in then putting a retractor down. Uh, the, the upper extremity, particularly around the hand wrist form, is uh, rich in tendons and nerves and vessels. So you want to make sure that you're avoiding those by spreading down to bone itself, putting down a um, soft tissue protector and avoiding any kind of injury to those structures because uh, it's, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. Once you've, once you've exposed down, you then insert the pins. Generally, you're gonna put a 3-0 size or equivalent in the metacarpal and a 4-0 size or equivalent in the radius. Uh, every system is a little bit different. Some will be self-drilling uh, pins that you just drill in and they stay there. Others will, will, be, will require you to pre-drill. So you have to be mindful of the system that you're using. Take a look at the pins, see if they're self-drilling or not. Um, uh, the, the traditional teaching is always better to drill and then insert the pins with the logic being that there's less chance for thermal necrosis and that your pins will hold better. But again, both are available to you. Again, use a guide when you're drilling, um, not only to protect soft tissue, but if you're putting two as you should, you can put them relatively parallel if you want to place them parallel or the, or the clamps you're going to be using, uh, use a parallel, um, uh, uh, system for, for, uh, attaching to the pins. So use a guide, be down to bone, um, and then be careful about your length. There are structures on the other side of the metacarpals and the radius, so you're gonna make sure that you're not plunging all the way across the other side and injuring structures. So you definitely have to be very mindful of structures about the, uh, about the upper extremity and specific around uh, the distal radius. Apply your rod. And again, every system is a little bit different. There's multiple pin clamp options. This is just a picture of one. This is not the only way to do this. This is just one of many ways to do it. And when you're applying your a rod, realize some basic tenets, and these are not. This is not uh, comprehensive. But generally, the more um, bars or rods that you apply, the more stability you will confer on your uh, construct. Uh, the more planes you apply it in will also confirm more stability. The closer your bar or rod is to the to the joint uh, and the, and the injury, the the stronger your stability or better your stability will be as well. So you want to leverage those as much as you can to to get garner as much stability as possible. And then you do your reduction. I mean, the traditional reduction just yank on it as hard as you can, and there's some truth to that. Uh, but you want to be careful about a few things. So again, with the distal radius, your primary reduction maneuver is a 
traction, ulnar deviation, and a volar flexion to help restore. And your and your typical uh, distorted fracture pattern, which is just typically a shortened dorsally angulated pattern. So that's typically what you want to do. But you don't want to overdo it. If you overdo and assume what they call the cotton loader position, you can you can put the patient in a in a position that's uh, prone to developing uh, carpal tunnel syndrome or CRPS. One of the ways you can kind of look at that is, is looking at the radiocarpal distance. If you're, if you're pulling too much traction, you'll see that the space between the proximal row and the radius really grow too much. And how much is too much is hard, is, is, a, is um, a nuanced thing, but again, hopefully you'll know it when you see it. Uh, some of the systems do have distractors that allow for some fine tuning. This is a picture of it on the top right, uh, which works quite well. So you apply your, um, your rod and your clamp, your clamp, then your rod, and then you apply this distraction. And this allows you to fine tune a little bit more distraction. I call this more micro, micro distraction while pulling on it's a little bit more uh, macro distraction, if you will. And then lastly, you can augment your fixation. So this does not have to be the extent of your fixation. You can add K wires uh, uh, to uh, add some additional uh, fracture reduction and stability through the styloid, lunar facet. Uh, fra multiple fracture fragments, et cetera. Again, every pin carries its own risk for infection or soft tissue irritation, uh, but don't be afraid to do that. One of the things I always advocate for is whenever you're placing K wires, is always be oscillating them in. Uh, there, there you will be uh, avoid some uh, wrapping up soft tissue that way. Um, you have to put a little bit more force on when you do that, but I, I routinely um, uh, require that uh, when, when K wires are being placed in the upper extremity. Again, you gotta be mindful of the radial sensory nerve. That nerve is always hanging around looking to get injured and torture you. It's not your friend, it's your enemy. Um, so you always wanna avoid the radial sensory nerve. Avoiding tendons is challenging in the, uh, in the distal radius because it's almost covered by tendons all the way around. Um, so you can either say it is what it is and go through them, or you can make little incisions, spread down to bone, try to move the tendons out of, way, out of the way and apply and place your um, pins. And for pins to really do their job, they need to be bicortical. So they need to have, they need to have, catch some far cortex, ideally to, to confer some stability. They're not inherently very stable, particularly if they're only unicortical. So um, post-operatively, a couple of things just to think about. Pin care is really important. Uh, teaching your patient how to manage the pins is critical uh, because we know one of the big things we worry about is infection with these. Um, and I'll just jump in. Antibiotics are often needed. I personally would have a very low threshold to give people antibiotics if they start developing any signs or symptoms of infection. Um, and we accept a little bit of it because we're going to try to keep this construct on for as long as possible to get the fracture to heal, and then we're going to get rid of it anyways. So if we can suppress that, uh, the potential infection long enough until we get the construct off, uh, that's, uh, that's in everyone's best interest. But you want to get them moving. So one of the challenges with these is that um, you're locking up their wrists and often putting them in some, um, in, under some tension. So the big thing that happens is uh, tendon, uh, uh, joint contractures, tendon stiffness. So you really want to get their, their fingers going and their, their tendons moving. One of the things that we deal with in the upper extremity is that we can make the x-rays look pretty good, but if the joints are stiff and they don't move, no one's happy. So getting them into rehab early is important. I actually send all my patients after any disarray surgery to rehab. Um, I don't do that for everything, but for this I do because far majority of patients do fine, but enough of them not don't do well to be a problem. And I think in the setting of an external fixation where the hardware can be very unsettling for people and they, it makes them very uncomfortable sometimes, having them work with a the therapist to make sure that they're moving along, they're reassured, they're getting their edema down, they're getting their joints mobilized and their tendon gliding is in your favor. And then lastly, get a plan for removal. You can do it either in the office or the OR. Everyone's a little bit different in terms of how you want to do it. I'm not going to get into the outcomes of this. Um, needless to say, there's tons and tons of papers looking at external fixation and its value. Uh, more recently in the past, I would say not the recent, recent history, but I would say the early 2000s, a lot of papers looked at uh, comparative data between internal fixation versus external fixation. And both are have been shown to work, again, the proper uh, implant applied with the proper technique works with the distal radius in general. Uh, but again, there is a difference in terms of uh, minor complications and radiographic parameters that bias towards plating. Plating generally does better in terms of less complications and less soft tissue problems and less infection. But again, XFIX works when necessary. Thank you.